Holy Father, as we anticipate the celebration of the coming of your Son um, and his anointing by the Holy Spirit, we thank you for all of the gifts we have from you, O Lord, especially our Savior Jesus, who took on our flesh and has kept it to take up all of our sins so that we will never keep them. And for that, we thank and praise you. And we also ask you to preserve the health and the lives, especially of the caregivers and the nurses who work with people who have this deadly virus, and yet they must go and help them, work with them, uh, change sheets, change diapers, wipe noses, and come into contact with these people and somehow come home and take care of their loved ones. We pray that you would preserve their health, uh, uh, be with the anxiety of their loved ones who worry about them and pray for them and help all who are troubled in this troubling time. We know that you are the one to whom we should look. And so we do. In Jesus' name, amen. I don't have an accurate count. It's four or five books of the Bible have a chapter nine prayer. Ezra, I think Nehemiah, 1 Kings, and Daniel really come to mind. In Kings, it's Solomon's prayer of dedication of the temple. It's fantastic. In Ezra, it's another one of those great, O oh Lord, we have sinned prayers. In Daniel, it is the prayer before us today. And uh, uh, when I read these prayers, as I read through the Bible, I, I want myself to slow down and savor every single phrase and word. Um, uh, these chapter nine prayers are not French fries. You don't eat them as fast as you can and go on. Um, they are, I just got a little bag of four of them. What are those chocolates that are individually wrapped in shiny wrapping? They're round, they're spheres, they're little rochier or something. What are those called, those chocolates? L Lind something okay um, there it, you th those are meant to be savored and that's what these prayers are of. I mean all of God's word is like that but I'll admit sometimes in a genealogy you know let's tip up the box and swallow it and go on you know and, and uh, I'll, I'll and I preach I, I taught about genealogies on Sunday but let's go on here so uh, in this uh, particular instance, on your handout, uh, there is a comment about the cycle of visions according to kings. So Daniel seems to follow a cycle chronologically through the historical parts. And then he backs up to where he started getting visions and he gives those to us in chronological order also. So... Uh, that's why I think of, the, of Daniel, if you remember the first class period we had, I said that I think of this book under the title, the, the Captivity and Apocalypse of Daniel. It's two separate things. And the Captivity, chapters 1 through 6, the Apocalypse, chapters 7 through 12, um, there, it's a unified work by the same author, um, but these two parts. And so chapters 1, 2, 3, 4, are by, or rather uh, under King Nebuchadnezzar. His dates are there in the margin. Um, and then chapter five, uh, Belshazzar. And chapter six, Darius, who we said is probably either Cyrus the Great or his general who came in and conquered the city. And we're with him again today. But then he backs up to the visions because he started getting visions under King Belshazzar. Uh, and then uh, a vision today or tonight under this Darius or Cyrus. And he finishes the book with just visions in the time of Cyrus the Great. Um, and uh, so a, a way of looking at the book and its chronology. So let's get going with verse one. Uh, in the first year of Darius, son of Xerxes, who was a Mede by descent and who was made king over the kingdom of the Chaldeans, and I'm going to pause there because 
I want to point out that I don't think that this Darius is Darius the Great, who lived long after this. Daniel is careful to call this guy Darius a Mede, not a Persian. And the Medes and the Persians are different, aren't they? Um, when we see the bear in the vision, he's leaning up on one side. I think because the Persians were a little bit superior to the Medes, at least they did more or were more powerful or they thought of themselves differently or what have you. But this Darius is a guy who is a Mede. Um, and so is he not Darius the Great who was a Persian? But somebody like Cyrus the Great who would be from Anshan or a Mede um, or his general Gubaru or wh wh whatever his name was. So just a comment. If this is going over your head, yeah, me too. Let's just move on. Okay. Verse 2. In the first year of his reign, which, by the way, is the first year uh, that the Persians had conquered Babylon. So we're out of Babylon now. We're into Persia now for the rest of Daniel. So the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood from the scrolls that according to the word of the Lord given to the prophet Jeremiah, the number of years it would take to complete the devastation of Jerusalem was 70 years. I'm going to read the prophecies from Jeremiah in a moment. But can we just pick apart this verse? Uh, what, what are the scrolls? That's exactly right. Yeah, although there's more than that, but that's exactly right. So Jeremiah writes uh, down his prophecies in scrolls, and Daniel's going to talk about the prophets who wrote by the hand a little bit later in this chapter, as opposed to just who spoke. Um, Daniel is understanding that Jeremiah is scripture. That's significant because they're contemporaries. Uh, can you think of another place in the Bible where one individual quotes another guy living at the same time and says that's scripture? I'm thinking of a very particular verse when I say this. Peter and Paul. Yeah, in 2 Peter, Peter mentions that Paul writes many hard things. Um, but like the other scriptures, Peter goes on to say. So Peter is telling us Paul is the inspired word of God. I mean, do we take Peter to be the inspired word of God? Yeah, that one verse accounts for an awful lot of the New Testament as the inspired word of God. Because if we take Peter to be an inspired author, we take the other apostles to be, correct? So that's who? Peter, who are the three apostles of Jesus who wrote New Testament books? Peter, John, and Matthew, first gospel. So Matthew, gospels of Matthew and John, John wrote five books altogether, and Peter writes two. Um, that's a big chunk of New Testament, right? Um, but then Peter says, Paul, how many things did Paul write? It's 13, 13 epistles of Paul. So the 27 New Testament books, we just accounted for 18, 19, 20, 21 of the 27 with that verse. That's pretty remarkable, isn't it? Um, then two of Jesus' brothers, James and Jude, if you want to, you know, uh, we can argue about who they were, but um, they were accepted very early on. That's... 22, 23, right? And what's left? The Gospel of Mark, which an early uh, uh, Christian uh, in the first century thought, or in the second century thought, that Mark wrote down what Peter preached. So when Peter talked about the Jesus stories, Mark wrote that down. Not the sermons, but the story that Peter told. That's the Gospel of Mark, essentially. And then Luke, uh, Luke is Paul's physician, and what two books does Luke write? Luke and Acts. Um, 24, 25, 26. That's only one book unaccounted for. Hebrews. Hebrews. Yeah, we don't know who wrote Hebrews. It's a sermon. Um, but 
Hebrews is quoted by the earliest of the church fathers as scripture. So um, that's the whole New Testament right there. Um, so Daniel and Jeremiah seem to have a relationship that reminds me of the relationship between Isaiah and Micah. Uh, about a hundred years before this, in the 720s, Isaiah lived in Jerusalem and preached. Micah lived outside of Jerusalem and preached. They are absolute contemporaries. I'm going to say they went to school together. Okay, that kind of contemporaries. They were right on the same level. And in their prophecies, it seems like sometimes they talk to each other. Um, Isaiah will say something about the virgin will conceive. And then Micah will say, oh yeah, it's going to be in Bethlehem, Ephrathah. And they, 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 they kind of finish each other's thoughts as if one gets a thought and the other one preaches a sermon about it. And then he has a thought and the other one preaches a sermon about it. And Micah is quite a bit shorter than Isaiah, but they, they seem to talk to each other in their prophetic books. And I think Daniel and Jeremiah are doing that in this chapter and maybe a couple of other places, but especially here in chapter 9 because Daniel's reading Jeremiah and saying that's the word of God. How long is the ca captivity supposed to last? And Daniel's looking at his calendar and he's saying, Lord, it's been 69 years. Jeremiah says it's supposed to last only 70. So just saying, Lord, you know, that's that kind of a chapter that we have going on here. Um, and the number of years it would take to complete the devastation of Jerusalem was 70 years. So, but, um, with regard to scrolls, that's the way that they were all written down was in, in the Old Testament. They were all written on scrolls. Um, the five books of Moses... Each one is its own scroll, big, big scroll. And in the, in the, in the um, synagogues, they kept these on big sticks. Do you remember when, when we were younger and libraries had newspapers? Do you know what I mean by big sticks now? Laura, this is before your time, I'm sorry. But, yeah, <laughs> but, but. The rest of us, we remember, yeah, newspaper, and they were, and and the, if you can imagine the scrolls like wrapped up on on big, big, heavy sticks, and so your there, there would be a cabinet, a wooden cabinet, in the in the synagogue, um, and that's where the, the the five scrolls of Moses would be there. There would be a scroll with maybe Joshua or Joshua and Judges combined. There would be a scroll of the prophet Samuel a scroll of the book of Kings, and then the Isaiah scroll, the Jeremiah scroll, the Ezekiel scroll, and then there would be a scroll of the Psalms. There might be one of Proverbs by itself, one of Job by itself, and then with probably Song of Solomon, and it was called, they're called the five rolls, the Megaloth, Song of Solomon, um, Lamentations, Ruth, and then there would be, um, Chronicles would be its own scroll and so forth. And that's, that's how they'd be in there, um, in that big cabinet. But they were not kept in jars. The, the Dead Sea Scrolls were not a library. They were an emergency, we got to hide these from the invaders. That's what that was. That's why they were in jars. But you didn't put valuable things in jars. You kept them in a cabinet in the synagogue. Um, and that, that's how they, and a scroll, we think of scrolls because as little kids we tried to make them, at least I sure did, um, out of paper, right? Because we have paper that's miles long. Their scrolls were made of what material? Oh, no, papyrus doesn't scroll. It's a sheet of paper. Papyrus is a sheet of paper. Sheepskin. Yeah, you would take lamb skin especially, scrape it, and it's nice and soft and pretty thin. Um, the consistency is a little bit like doubled construction paper. Does that help? That's about the consistency of, of lambskin. So uh, uh, heavy but kind of soft and uh, like, like, kind of like that. Um, and a sheet might be, they would, they would be irregular because animals don't seem to produce sheets of paper in even quantities. 
Um, so you get one about like that big and like that big, and they would cut it and uh, overlay it, and then you stitch them together. Um, uh, which is why in India, when they talk about a saying, it's called a sutra. Are you aware of that? The sutras? Because that's what a stitch is called. What does a doctor call a stitch in your body? A suture. That's the word. It's just a Sanskrit word that means a stitch. Um, and, uh, and, and in poetry, one stitch is one line. You know, but they would stitch them together. And, uh, and I've seen, like the, the, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, I've seen the Great Isaiah Scroll once in, in Chicago. And uh, that was back in the 90s. And it was, on a, it was a huge round thing that it was put on. Um, but stitched together every couple of, you know, not even a couple of feet, but more like every, I don't know, 13, 18 inches. And another piece was stitched on. And then you had columns about like one of our pieces of paper. Not very much different than that. A little bit taller maybe. Um, with all of the writing on it. And you would roll it up. Remarkable that when Jesus went into the synagogue, was handed the scroll of the prophet Isaiah, he found the spot without, you know, needing to, to, to search. He unrolled it right to where, you know, you're supposed to be obviously educated in Hebrew and obviously knew Isaiah well enough that by looking at the tops of the lines, he knew what chapter he was in and how far he had to go to get to the spot. Um, in the time of Jesus, the, a scroll would not have had vowels yet. That's correct. Uh, sometimes yes, sometimes no. It depended on the scroll. There are scrolls where the words are separated by dots or by slight spaces. Some of the scrolls that do have vowels are really smashed together. Um, however, Hebrew helps you. Because Hebrew, uh, the, 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 the later Hebrew script after the exile, um, some of the consonants have a, a version that happens at the end of the word. It's called a final. And so it looks different if it's at the end of a word. So you can tell where the ends of the words are that way because of those final consonants. Kaf and uh, Sade and a couple of others have that. A noon has a special, a maim, M and N, and, sorry, um, have special final versions that you can, you can tell. Greek only has one of those. Uh, one, of, one of the Greek S's has a final version. Otherwise, it's always all Greek lettering is the same. Um, but Hebrew is, is adjective poor. And so it tends to use nouns as adjectives. You know? And you just have to learn that as you're, as you're working through it. Or it just lots and lots of participles. We don't, like, we don't like participles in English. We like to use adjectives, you know. Um, uh, uh, primitive English, earlier English, did like to use some nouns instead of adjectives. And of course, you get back to uh, uh, the earliest English poems like Beowulf, and they didn't have a word for blue yet. That's, that's, that's how early... Uh, blue is one of the, la I, I read this a little while ago, blue is one of the last words, color words, adopted in most languages. Many languages just, they don't understand that there's supposed to be a word for blue. Uh, bright. The sky is bright or the sky is dark. But they don't think of it as being a color because you look in the morning and it's pink or it's orange or it's black. and So it's just bright. Um, and, of course, what do they call the sea in Beowulf? What color? Maybe you didn't read Beowulf recently. Wine dark. It's always the wine dark sea. Or the whale road, Hranrade. I, I love that one. The, it's, a, it's called a kenning when you describe by an adjective. The whale road. You all know the whale road? You know the song at least? I've been working on the whale road. I'm done. Let's go on with Daniel, please. Uh, I live to, 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 to say that pun, though. Okay, uh, this is where Daniel got the 70 years. This is Jeremiah, verse 25. This whole land will become a desolation and a ruin, and these nations will serve the king of Babylon 70 years. 
When the 70 years are finished, I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, the land of the Chaldeans, for their guilt, declares the Lord. I will make it a desolation forever. That's Jeremiah 25. Then a couple chapters later, the prophet says, this is what the Lord says. After 70 years have gone by in Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my gracious word to bring you back to this place. And um, I know that a lot of commentaries say that Daniel was reading the earlier verse from Jeremiah, which is about the punishment of Babylon. But I think Daniel's reading this one, which is the, the gospel message, I'll bring you back. That makes more sense to me. Also, I am amazed at the number of connections between this chapter 9 prayer and Jeremiah chapter 29. And I, I'm kind of wondering if Daniel hadn't read Jeremiah 29 and now he's praying about all of it um, in chapter 9. Like I said, I think the prophets are talking to each other across the, across the miles. There are no centuries. They're contemporaries. But Daniel is, or rather Jeremiah, is currently, I believe, in Egypt. Got kidnapped and taken down to Egypt. Daniel is back in Babylon in the court of the king. Make sense? Okay. I just want to look at the chronology of this a little bit, of, of the captivity. So you've seen this slide a couple weeks ago. The captivity takes about 20 years to get going. And if I, and I also, I, I pointed this out on Sunday in a different class. Each of the four major prophets, who are the four major prophets? The long prophets. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel. Okay? Each of the four major prophets are connected to the captivities in some way. Isaiah saw the northern tribes go into captivity. Daniel went with the first exiles into the Babylonian captivity. Ezekiel goes with the second batch of Babylonian captives. And Jeremiah is shackled up in order to go with the third group of captives to, to Babylon. But he gets released by the general Nebuchadnezzar. So all four of the major prophets directly tied to the captivities, to Assyria and to Babylon. Um, let's look at this a different way, which is just by chronology. Um, if, if, if this looks like a lot of busyness on the screen, let me help you. The first captives get brought back in the first return about 70 years later. The second captives get brought back in the second return about 70 years later. Now, that doesn't mean that some of the second captives didn't go home with the first group. Does that make sense? So, you know, they did, it, it, it wasn't like you had an ear tag that said, you know, or you had to wear a blue t-shirt, I'm sorry, a, a, a wine dark t-shirt, as opposed to a red t-shirt. Um, uh, Greek does have a word for blue, by the way. Um, but, uh, uh, however, uh, uh, the third group of captives, it's 128 years before the third return happens with um, Ezra. But uh, some of those third captives may have gone back with the first return. Some of the Israelites chose to remain behind in Babylon or in Persia. Can you think of a couple of them? Who stayed in Babylon? Didn't go home. Nehemiah, he's the hardest one. Way to go, Jameis. Yeah, Nehemiah gets a job in the Babylonian court. He's the cupbearer to the king, and he has to ask permission. to. And then the king says, by the way, you've got to come back. So he's there a few years, and he has to return. I was thinking of the easy ones, the beautiful queen of Persia and her uncle. Esther, Esther and Mordecai, yeah, they chose to stay behind. Um, so some people didn't go back, but a lot of people did. With uh, Verse 3, with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes, I turned my face to the Lord God to seek him in prayer and plead for grace. I prayed to the Lord my God and I made confession. So, anybody here uh, grow up on a farm? Sackcloth? Want to give me a farm comparison? Gunny sack. Made of burlap. Yeah, probably. Actually, that would be a nice bit of sackcloth. Sackcloth was worse than that. But, um, but you know what? I'm, I'm not an advocate 
for flagellation, which is whipping yourself like out of the snow on one foot, you know, while you recite something. That, that's, that's not what I'm an advocate for. But when you're tempted, a little discomfort, a little self-control can help, can't it? Well, you know, I, I'm, I'm not saying you should hurt yourself, but um, uh, if you're so comfortable that you're um, vulnerable to this particular temptation, maybe not so comfortable wouldn't be a bad idea. And in, the, in scriptural times, they wore sackcloth sometimes. Also, sackcloth was a sign of mourning and grief, but can also be a way to uh, uh, attempt to avoid temptation. But fasting sackcloth, ashes sprinkled on the head, turned my face, and I made, at the end of verse 4, I made confession. The, the Hebrew word um, yada, um, uh, to, to confess, means both kinds of confessions that we use. What are the two kinds of confessions we do in worship? Confess, perfect. We confess our sins, we confess our faith, right? We confess our sins to receive the absolution, and we confess our faith using the creeds, statement of faith. And that's what it means in Hebrew also. So yada, to publicly expose your sinfulness or publicly declare your faith. Both are in the lexicon and both can be shown in passages. So here, Daniel doing both. We're going to see both in this in this prayer in chapter 9. You've been listening to Invisible Church, the Bible study podcast from St. Paul's Lutheran Church, New Wall, Minnesota.